see. And we're live. Excellent. Welcome, everybody. I'm Philipp Leitner. I'm an associate professor at Chalmers University of Technology, and I have the big pleasure and big honor today to host the second Ask Me Anything session. We have three panelists, but at the moment we are still waiting for our third panelist. But we can already get started in the meantime. And the way how I would organize this panel is uh, that we first do a very quick round of introductions. And ideally, we're going to start with the people who are already here, which are Hiram Wright from Google and Dako Baka from ING. And so what I would propose is that you do a very short introduction of who you are, what you're doing, what your interests and expertise in DevOps is, call it two to three minutes about. And then we will get started with questions from the audience. And unlike in the last panel, we're not going to do any presentations or anything. We're just going to keep this all kind of interactive. Sounds good? Sounds great. Good. So then let's start with Hiram, since he's already on, in the picture. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself for us and for the audience? Sure. Uh, I'm Hiram Wright. I'm a software engineer at Google. Um, I work, so I lead the code health team that we have in the company. Uh, that team is responsible for uh, improving the quality of our software across the company and developing scalable techniques to do that. So I am very interested in how do we maintain and mutate and uh, migrate uh, very large code bases uh, in a very scalable way. Um, this involves everything from low-level APIs to high-level system migration. Um, our team is also uh, exploring how do we reduce technical debt and a bunch of other ways of just basically increasing, improving the quality of the software and making engineers more productive. Uh, I'm also one of the editors as well as the author of a couple of chapters in the recently released Software Engineering at Google book uh, by O'Reilly uh, that came out earlier this year. And uh, I made a pithy little statement several years ago uh, about software engineering and APIs that a bunch of my colleagues have called Hiram's Law. So if you've ever heard of that, I'm the Hiram for whom that is named. Um, and I say that with a fair amount of humility because I'm not the person who gave it that name. So don't, I, I don't, I'm not trying to plug my own, my own, my own law here. Um, but yeah, so I'm mostly interested in how do we uh, improve the quality of software engineering and make software engineers more productive. Excellent. Taco. I'm Taco Baka from ING Bank and I lead the team who is doing the, giving us the engineering platform for uh, IT engineers of ING worldwide. So an engineering platform basically means a continuous delivery pipeline, uh, a scheme to be, and uh, all the stuff around that, where we aim to, uh, uh, let's say, continue to innovate, but also try to bring the best possible experience and the best experience, uh, the best practices of all the engineers towards uh, all the countries uh, worldwide where IT engineers are uh, currently working. And uh, we've been doing that for a couple of years already. Uh, I've been already with ING for more than 20 years, uh, doing several of these kind of assignments. And currently, this, uh, this is my current assignment. We are responsible for, uh, like I said, uh, uh, in products, uh, ServiceNow product, uh, Azure DevOps pipeline, that sort of things. Excellent. And now we are also complete. So Lori Williams is also here. Yeah, yes. Lori, can you introduce yourself for the audience, please? Sure. So I'm um, Lori Williams, and I'm a professor at North Carolina State University in the computer science department. And I guess I've been involved with DevOps-ish kinds of things for more than 20 years. Um, did my PhD in, in agile software development related topics and have been working um, along those lines since then. Um, from a specifically DevOps standpoint, over the last five years, um, I've been running what we call the Continuous Deployment Summit um, out in Silicon Valley. Um, so we ran those at um, Facebook, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, and Twitter. Um, and for each of those, we brought together about 15 companies in a like a kind of an intimate setting. Um, one person per company, so that people were more likely to like really share 
um, honestly, rather than just try to say all the rosy things. And we talked about the challenges that people had going towards a continuous deployment setting. Excellent. So now let's start the actual panel and let's move to questions from the audience. And the way how I will do this is I will go over Slack and look at what questions are upvoted a lot. So if you are interested in a question, either find the question that is already posted and upvoted or ask your own question. So the first question that I received is Jordan, uh, Jordan Henkel asks, what are some of the challenges of representing DevOps artifacts? So he says, for context, we have many great uh, representations of code, abstract syntax trees, control flow graphs, and so on. But what about DevOps artifacts? Is there any go-to representation how you're normally working with when you're talking about DevOps artifacts? And maybe you also want to clarify a little bit what a DevOps artifact is for you, because that might be the first question to answer here. So it's not directed at anybody specific. So whoever has thoughts on this, just fire away. Yeah, I, I don't know um, about many DevOps artifacts. I mean, I think that, um, you know, they're, they've, they're, you go with the flow, you know, mm -hmm. and so I, I don't think there's a lot of, in particular, artifacts that are produced along the way that I can think of. Mm -hmm. But the other no, it doesn't ring any bells to me. Maybe uh, the person who asked the question can elaborate a little bit more what the DevOps artifact is in his or her mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But one one type of artifact that I could imagine would be, for instance, log traces or you know monitoring data. Right. I'm not sure if that's what Jordan meant, but that would be mm -hmm. kind of my first association. Another artifact might be just the releases or test outputs, you know, as you do continuous uh, integration, right? Um, most of these types of, <clears throat> at Google, most of these types of things are tracked in a central system for the whole company, right? Which gives uh, centralized teams like, <clears throat> excuse me, centralized teams like mine, a way of looking at the experiences of engineers across the company and being able to do analyses about, you know, what are common types of build failures? What are common types of of anti-patterns in code? What are the, you know, what's the flakiest test across the company and how can we identify patterns uh, in a very broad, uh, from a very broad palette of, of these kinds of things. Um, most of that is gonna be company specific, I think. And just, we, I don't yet think that as an industry, we've settled on standards for you know, how do we archive releases and how do we, you know, what is even the metadata associated with those? Mm -hmm. Right, so, and you know, to, to go back on your, um, like the log traces and uh, you, it, definitely a lot, a lot, a lot of monitoring that happens and, and log data that's analyzed. So that's a good, <clears throat> a good thing to bring up. Um, and it use, like I'm a security person as well. And so one of the benefits of the log and the, anal the analysis of the log <clears throat> is it can be easier for companies to understand if they are under attack because that means the behavior is different than um, they're expecting um, a lot of companies in a DevOps, uh, you know, that, that have a DevOps flow can also do um, a B pattern, like looking for a B patterns, you know, having um, features that they're testing and they're looking for differences if they have, if they, in, in, you know, implement a new feature. And so they're looking for normal behavior and then it's, they're more easily able to identify when there's anomalous behavior happening because of the monitoring that's taking place. So it's kind of a good side effect. It can happen because of DevOps and continuous deployment. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, Jordan has clarified that he's talking about logs, config files, Docker files, Travis files, Helm charts. So yeah, I, I guess- think one of the most important things there is that uh, uh, while in the traditional way we used to only have application code uh, as part of version control and basically the pipeline, huh? uh, we think that everything should be code. Mm -hmm. um, everything should be versioned uh, under version control. Uh, it's really, really important huh, to, to indeed identify all your artifacts and make sure that everything is shifted left. It sounds a bit like a uh, buzzword huh, nowadays. So I will try to avoid it, but it's very important that you really try to define up front. And, uh, and, and maybe in this company, I'm, I'm, uh, nobody even thinks about it. Eh? But basically, you should 
prohibit anybody from walking into a production site or even any site without, uh, especially manually. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. But a lot of things that you see uh, is that code is going through the pipeline very automatically and then still somebody has to SSH into the production environment to set a firewall or to do that sort of stuff. And uh, that really breaks your chain and that really breaks your security completely. Mm. And so all your artifacts must be through the pipeline. Everything should be code as much as possible. And that goes for everything. Metadata, config files, test scripts, the whole bunch. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, at Google, our version control system is a source of truth, right? So I can't push anything to production unless the config file for that change is already checked into version control, which implies that it's been reviewed by somebody else. and. Mm. You know, I can't do anything unilaterally for, for just these reasons. I think part of the thing too is any such system that stores this information needs to be as part of the, the shift left, right? How do we get that information to the engineers as, and make it accessible to them as quickly as possible, right? So an engineer should be able to access the logs from a production machine, you know, from a production job. They should be able to access the, the, the release failures, the, the, all of the stuff that is, uh, makes it easier for them to, to do their job and, and diagnose failures earlier and sooner in the pipeline and supposed to like later on, you know, three days after the release has been pushed. Good, so let's move on to the next question. Hang Li is asking, uh, in the current DevOps practices at ING and Google, what are the responsibilities for different roles, developers, operators, testers? And do these roles well, still exist uh, in that way? Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, can I start? Yes, go ahead. Okay, and then uh, my colleagues can, can fill in. Uh, in ING, we don't have uh, testers or programmers or whatever. We just uh, have engineers. Uh, we do still have ops engineers and dev engineers, but they work closely together and the boundaries are, are getting le uh, they're less, less, less and less segregated. And the segregation of duties is not in the function, it's in the automation. Uh, so that means that it's not necessary to have, let's say, dev, uh, that you say, okay, dev cannot access production. It's way more important uh, that only ops can do it. It's way more important, for example, that nobody single-handedly can put something into production uh, without maybe a second pair of eyes or an automation that checks it. Uh, so it's a totally different way of looking at your roles. And so we, uh, of course, uh, uh, when I say engineers, of course, somebody will be better in testing and somebody else will be better in programming. That will happen. But we think that the, uh, the essence is that you are an engineer, that you are a good engineer. And I would, I would say at Google, uh, we don't differentiate very much either. There's a software engineering role, which is primarily based uh, around developing products uh, or, or tools that other teams might use, you know, internal products or external products. Uh, there's also a site reliability engineering role, which uh, has been said, this is what happens when you give a sysadmin to software engineers, essentially. Uh, they build a bunch of software to do all the sysadmining and then go and keep, keep doing that, right? So the site reliability engineering role is largely, uh, their task is spending at least half of their time building automation and building um, improved tooling around lots of these functions, right? So nobody wants to administer, you know, dozens of data centers by hand, right? So we need to build software to do that kind of thing. Uh, and that's the site reliability uh, role fits into a lot of that, right? So they've built a lot of the release practices and built the tools that, that encode that, right? They want to reduce toil is the word that we use a lot, right? Reduce all any manual steps that, that, that happen, you know, how do we, we in build engineering into that. Um, for testing, we largely depend on engineers to write their own tests and that has mixed success, uh, as you can imagine, right? So oftentimes engineers don't test things they know will break because they don't wanna have failing tests. Uh, and so this is a, a culture thing that we have to, have to contend with. But. Yeah, one thing that, I mean, I can continue that question with, with both Google and I, um, ING that, um, in the continuous deployment summit, what we saw was, you know, we we wrote a paper and we called it "You Are the Support Person" was one of the patterns, which meant that, um, you know, if an engineer caused a problem, they were the ones that were woken up in the middle of the night to fix the problem. 
but then different groups had different, different companies had different ways of handling that. Um, some did, yes, you caused the problem, you are woken up and others had like a, a particular engineering group would have turn, take turns and they would be the support person for their group that week or that day. And so I don't know if you want to comment on how you handle that. So for us, uh, most teams, uh, it kind of depends on what your, your service level agreement is, right? So like uh, I'm on a particular team where our service level agreement is best effort, which means if everyone's on vacation, your problem gets solved when we get back off vacation. Uh, uh, and, and that's like really that a, a, what's that? <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> well, it's really a discussion about, um, you know, the, if, if there's teams that depend on our service more than that, they depend on our, our, our infrastructure more than that, right? Their job is, a, you know, they have to essentially depend on us then we get to have a discussion about whether they're going to fund the extra support level that they require, right? Are they going to fund having somebody on call and, and being able to, to respond at every hour of the night, right? Because that, that has an increased cost on the team, obviously, and we're going to pass those costs on to people that depend on us. Mm -hmm. um, on the other side of the spectrum are teams that, uh, you know, I think Gmail, right? Or, or some of the, you know, the people that monitor our network traffic, right? They have very short, you know, uh, service level agreements in terms of, you know, an outage happens and they have to respond very quickly and they have dedicated teams that are, that are on call all the time. Um, but in order to get that kind of support, you have to meet certain levels of quality in your process and in your software. So like my project isn't yet at the, the level of quality that we'd be able to hand it off to one of those teams because they're not going to take it on unless we've met a certain quality bar that they feel comfortable with because they don't want to get woken up in the middle of the night either. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I can, I can uh, definitely uh, say the same. Uh, it depends on the sort of level agreement. Uh, uh, we have a uh, around the globe kind of uh, service. Uh, so it can be different engineers who will be available for your support. Uh, but I think it's indeed a fair question always like uh, who's going to be uh, the ones who's going to fix this problem in the middle of the night, depending if it's locally in the middle of the night. Uh, and the responsibility is definitely a shared responsibility but uh, depending on if it's necessary or not. Mm -hmm. Not everything needs platinum support. And, and I would also add, I think a big part of the software engineering or the things that we're trying to do in the software engineering space is how can we take things that would happen in the middle of the night and make them things that happen at test time or build time, mm -hmm. right? So we do a lot of aggressive static analysis. We do a lot of, uh, you know, we have, we have a lot of compiler annotations around threading, for instance. And so the compiler can do analysis about whether your, your service is going to deadlock. And you get that at compile time instead of at the middle of the night when your service is deadlocked and now you have to wake up and, and try to debug it, right? And so that's one, another way of solving this issue is like, how do we push that error handling and recognition as early in the process as possible, right? The shift left paradigm mm -hmm. uh, as early okay. in the, the process as possible so that we don't even have those events in the, in the future. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, which I mean, you know, from a, Professor's standpoint, you know, it does seem like this new way of developing um, is a means of getting people to, to have better engineering practices because the yeah. feedback is so imminent. Well, the, we, the, the world has changed. Eh? In the old days, the, 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 the developers built something and then at the very, very end, they came the ops people and the dev people said, hey, give me this, do you like it? Take it or leave it, swallow this because the deadline is tomorrow. So, uh, but that is not uh, that is not the case anymore. So, right. from the beginning, the ops people are there for, as far as you can call them ops people. And from day one, we are testing if it will uh, succeed in uh, running into production. Uh, this is one of the key uh, items: is that ops people don't check it at the end; they check it at the beginning. So they automate their own controls. For example, uh, it's a, a totally way uh, different way of uh, of thinking and different way of operating. It also meant that we had to look for a lot of new uh, ops engineers because the old ones were more functionally uh, oriented, did not fit the profile anymore. Right. So one further question from the audience, and this might be more for Laurie, but of course, it's from a research perspective that DevOps uh, should be integrated with. Right. So, um, you know, from security perspective, uh, you know, there's a lot of actually good things about security and DevOps. Um, like, like I just mentioned that like your engineers have an incentive to use good engineering skills because 
um, they're called out, if you will, pretty quick if they don't. Um, and so they're, they're more likely. Um, and, and another like known benefit of a DevOps kind of uh, is that you have the ability to quickly pivot. Um, because that's part of the, the process. So if you do have a security problem, you have the mechanism to quickly, you know, roll out a fix um, versus, you know, like that, the example that I've used when I've done presentations on the two um, back, you know, back 2014, I think it was, or 18, I think it was 14, um, that there was a security vulnerability in the Chrysler Jeep and they, um, in order to fix the security vulnerability in the Jeep, they had to send, they did send out USB drives to all the car owners. That was the only mechanism that was available to get the fix out. And, you know, you know how many of those USB sticks were actually used? None, probably. Um, and versus the a security vulnerability was found like two or three months later in a Tesla car and they rolled out a fix over the air. And so like, that's a great thing from a security perspective, the ability to, to recover. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, the continuous monitoring underway, um, you know, can alert that there is a security problem, but then, you know, an open area is what's happening with such fast development. Um, are people actually, you know, really doing the security testing. And actually we can, we can send this one back to um, Google and ING um, to, to answer, um, you know, so people, are people actually doing the testing that they need to do from a security perspective? Um, of the summit companies, like fit, there was 15 and um, some, there was a range. And in some cases um, the, the automated testing did include security testing. Um, in some cases it definitely did not. and. There was, you know, like, so there was little evidence of SEC DevOps, which is the other acronym. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was still like those security people, they disrupt us. You know, we don't want um, to have anything to do with them. Um, but, you know, Google, you know, they were one of the companies at the summit and there was more integration in place. Um, you know, one, from my standpoint, one of the research um, questions I would love to answer is, um, how long do you have? So if you have a, you know, not all DevOps doesn't mean continuous deployment. It doesn't mean you're deploying 200 times a day. Um, but if you are in that kind of a mode, how long do you have before someone discovers your vulnerability? So maybe you are able to deploy 200 times a day and the security testing is a little bit behind. Um, and as soon, you know, you find that vulnerability and you fix it in the next release, next, you know, deployment. And that's good enough. So, you know, what's what's the amount of time that you have depending upon the type of vulnerability? So anyway, maybe maybe the two of you can talk about the security integration with your DevOps. Sure. You ever first? Sure. Uh, you know, the it's double-edged sword in some senses. Uh, you know, as you know, Laurie, like most of security is about trade-offs. Um, and in this case, you know, particularly with deployments, right? If we move to a very faster deployment cycle, security is one of those things that uh, not everyone thinks of as a first order, first order thing, right? Most people, right. people are worried about product features, and you know, then maybe fixing high profile bugs, and you know, security will get to it eventually, right? Like um, now, I say that as individuals, obviously, Google as a company cares very deeply about security and, and privacy, and, and I don't want to give the impression that, that we don't. Um, and so the question is, uh, well, the, the the nice thing about releasing frequently though, is that if you release several times a day or several times a week, right? You don't, you always know that there's an opportunity to fix things, right? right. Like uh, if I release three times a year, then, you know, I can spend a lot of time doing my reviews and, and, and really an analyzing my software and doing my security testing. But this also means that if I don't get it right, that I have to wait another four months for my next release to fix, fix something, right? Or ship a USB drive to everybody or, you know, whatever the case is. Right. And I think that the latter, <clears throat> that the benefits of of shipping more frequently and of a more rapid cadence actually outweigh the the drawbacks because in the in the case where you're shipping more frequently, you can still do the third thorough security reviews. There's nothing preventing you from doing that. Right. Right. But in the case where you're shipping less frequently, right, where you have these very long protracted release cycles, uh, there is no way of of 
pushing releases any quicker. Um, and if there is, like that's fraught with peril, right? Like doing special one-off releases outside of your normal process is is its own set of problems. Um, and so I think that the real question and the real like thing is how do we change <clears throat> engineers' perspectives and their their motivations where they're doing the same type of rigorous security reviews and security uh, thought processes that they would do in a more protracted environment uh, in much shorter a shorter time window. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things too is if you're releasing very frequently, you know, if I have, you know, a dozen releases per day, that's once every two hours, it may take me longer than two hours to qualify a release, right? And so imagine that my, my release pipeline itself is several hours long. This means that I have a number of releases in the pipeline simultaneously. And even if I find, you know, the, 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 the time from, from fix to deploy isn't when's my next release, it's how long does my security, how long does my, does my qualification pipeline last, right? And so one of the things that I think that we should do as an industry is figure out how do we shrink that pipeline, right? Whether that means testing in more in parallel, whether it means more automation, whether that means, uh, you know, being more intelligent about the kinds of testing that we do, right? How do we shrink that qualification pipeline so that we can get from fix to deploy faster rather than just, we're deploying five times a day, but, you know, it takes us, we're deploying yesterday's code today because we, we have to spend that long trying to, mm -hmm. trying to qualify release. Right. Yeah. True. Well, like, to, to add on that, uh, ING is, of course, uh, a financial institution. So risk and compliance are, are top three priorities. Uh, and that means that uh, having built-in compliance is one of the key uh, things that we want to bring into our automation. Uh, a continuously, continuously pipeline pipelines should have built-in uh, uh, security. Uh, and it should not even be possible to deploy to production without it. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the old fashioned way that we did it, it was first you uh, made software and you deployed it. And then afterwards, the engineers had to prove that they did it compliantly, which is called a sort of shift, right? Uh, what we don't want, what we do want is that the pipeline itself proves to you that you are actually working compliant. Uh, and for us, that is that, that's a key uh, top priority. And so there's a lot of automation in place that prevents you from making that change if it doesn't uh, adhere to certain security standards. Uh, there's a whole control framework that has to be adhered to, otherwise no go. And that will indeed impact speed, uh, uh, like Ian said. I'm sure we cannot keep up with your pace, but maybe we don't even want to, uh, because the security comes first. Yeah, and one thing that I'll add, this is a light bulb that went on. Um, so it was actually, there was a Facebook paper and Facebook participated in the, um, in the summit and what they had in their paper was that they had like when when a change has a security and particularly a privacy implication that they had a separate process for that and you know they would go through extra checks and then so you know one time i asked like how do you reconcile like single branch and this other process for these particular changes and you know the light bulb was probably obvious to many people, but what they said is they put things behind a feature flag. And so if they put it behind a feature flag, it's turned off and mm -hmm. it is the security and privacy checks. Once they're done, then the feature flag can be turned on. So they can still have continuous deployment. They can still deploy all the time, okay. have, you know, not have multiple branches and then still have special processes um, for things that have in particular, you know, dangerous security and privacy implications. I'd say there's a similar, uh, you know, situation in a place like Google, right? Where obviously there's going to be some things have more security implications than others, and ultimately we, you know, it's up to the security review team and the engineers to figure out what falls into what bucket. Yeah. But I I, I want to go back briefly to to Taco because one thing that you said I found really interesting, which is that you said automation is a really good thing for security and compliance. And that makes a lot of sense to me, but it's also kind of the opposite of what we heard when DevOps became a big thing in, in, in financial industries, where a lot of companies said, we would like to do more DevOps, we would like to be more automated, but we can't because there is a process that says human mm -hmm. needs to sign off A and B. So is yeah, this- that is, uh, That's is a very good question. Companies have learned or? Yeah, what you need to do, eh? uh, if you look at, uh, and I will not elaborate too, too long, eh? but we have to adhere to rules and regulations, laws, rules and regulations. And those have usually been translated into uh, a few steps uh, into a control framework. 
So you have controls that make sure that you adhere to all those policies. Eh? An individual programmer doesn't know exactly what is in the laws or what is in the regulations, but he or she does know what is in the controls that have been translated. Now, if you don't change your controls, eh, uh, uh, because those, those controls have been made in a time that we didn't do a lot of automation and things went very differently. So one of the, the biggest mistakes was is that we started to automate those controls directly. Uh, and then you're basically uh, automating a broken system. What you do need to do is think back, okay, but what is the, what is the risk that I'm actually trying to mitigate? Uh, so you need, with uh, continuous delivery and automation in mind, you need to re-design uh, your controls. And this is where it really can start to get difficult because a lot of companies say, yeah, but we cannot do that because we have this authority and they bring out the controls and we just have to adhere to it. Uh, a typical example is about backups. Uh, while everybody is already working with high availability setups, with containers or whatever, with a very short backup. If we don't need a backup. Uh, uh, or that sort of, let's say, uh, more old-fashioned things. You, need, you really need to rethink your, uh, your controls, you rethink your risks, and then make sure that you automate based on the process that you need. And then you really take a step forward. Otherwise, you will automate a broken system. Let's move on to the next question from the audience. And I guess this is a question that will as come as a surprise to nobody, but Malik is basically trying to ask about the connection between machine learning, AI, and DevOps. And specifically, he wants to know how can we as a community encourage and, uh, encourage and better adopt DevOps practices uh, for the source code that's produced when, when, when doing machine learning kind of experiments? Is this something that we should do? I think this also links a little bit back to the panel we had yesterday, but from a DevOps perspective, is this something we should do? Should there be a DevOps for ML pipelines? I would say, of course. Yeah. But I first would like to give the word to the professor. No, I mean, I, I agree that, I mean, of course, I mean, there's a lot of added checks um, along the way. Um, I, and I think that, you know, I guess a, a reflection I'll have is that sometimes machine learning and AI pipelines are developed by um, people who are not engineers. Um, and so the, I think integrating, you know, all of the, the, the checks that Hiram and Taco have been talking about, all the additional testing and whatnot um, into those pipelines would be beneficial for the pipelines. Um, and, and it would probably be a, a big culture change um, for them. So, so yes, I think it would be great, but I do think that um, there's a, a, big, a bigger divide I, I will really admit I'm not an ML or AI expert, right? So I, I, I will, will disclaim that expertise really quick. I would say that a lot of the things that I see around Google, you know, we obviously have a lot of uh, AI and ML processes in place, like um, that it's still treated very much as a, you know, I, I produce this model and it's a black box from a software engineering perspective, right? And I have no way of actually doing any more thorough testing than just put stuff in, see what comes out. And I, I don't even know what's supposed to come out, so I can't validate it in that way, right? Um, and this concerns me as an engineer for a number of reasons, uh, primarily being like, how do we even know it's correct? How do we know it's unbiased? How do we know that it mm -hmm. is doing the kinds of things that we want to, right? Very simple things like spell check, maybe you can eyeball and, and, and figure that out, but like very more complex models and more complex things, it it's a much uh, harder task. And I don't think there's been a lot of work done in academia or, or um, we're just starting to do this kind of work you know, in industry about how do we uh, validate that these models are doing, especially these very complex models, doing the kinds of things that we want them to do. Right. Yeah, I agree. And I, I would say on top of that, eh, uh, let's first start to get good metrics. Eh? Uh, a lot of companies uh, don't even have proper metrics. Eh? And talking about AI, uh, machine learning is, is still way off. So once you have a good data set, a reliable data set, the data that you can trust, then you can start to see the patterns and maybe hey, you can uh, develop some algorithms that are really going to help you to, uh, for example, predict or whatever. Uh, there, there might be possibilities to that. 
I actually have a class currently uh, that is working on uh, a machine learning algorithm to predict the number of story points of a new story. Um, I'm interested to see if they will succeed. I don't know yet. Uh, but for me, there's, these are still all experiments because basically uh, I still have doubts about the metrics if they are good enough to do these kind of things. So uh, whilst I said, yes, of course, we need to do machine learning, I'm also a bit hesitant to, uh, I have a lean black belt uh, uh, background. And there, uh, first of all, uh, how reliable is your data? How reliable is your, is your metric system, etc.? First those. And then uh, uh, before we, we come up with all kinds of algorithms, computer says no, and nobody understands why. Uh, I don't think that is the proper way to go. So with, 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 with a proper sensible mind, uh, we should experiment, uh, but be careful. Yeah, we had, I mean, those who are academics will know this thing called Dogstall, which is, uh, you know, academic retreat center in a castle in Germany. Um, and we come together in Dogstall to, um, you know, explore academic subjects. And this past year, uh, maybe it was the end of last year, I went to a Dogstall at the, you know, uniting machine learning and AI people with software engineering people. And, you know, I, I, I'll say that there, it's two different worlds at this point um, and people in two different languages, speaking two different languages. And so like there, there's a lot of room for the coming together. And I think that that coming together, you know, like you're, the questions about DevOps in particular, but it's really even just any kind of software engineering and validation. I mean, these are just terms they don't hear because it, you know, AI people, machine learning people, I mean, increasingly can become engineers, but in our group, a lot of it were domain experts. Like they knew their domain, they were environmentalists or they were you know, some, someone that maybe had a statistics background and they were working in a specific domain. And any of the practices we talk about with validation, verification, testing, and it's just like not part of their world. And so coming together is a big thing. There's also for people in security, um, you might know the name Gary McGraw, who was a very well-known consultant in the security area. And he had a big wave of work, you know, 10 years worth of work called built in, um, BSIM, built in security, so built in software security, which was bringing in software security practices to software development. And now he has a new wave built in machine learning, which is bringing, you know, software engineering and security um, into machine learning. So there, there's just a long way to go. Yeah. So let's, let's move to machine learning thing. We, 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 I think we have another ask me anything on machine learning. So maybe let's not <laughs> go too deep into, <laughs> into other people's turf. And oh, I, I want to change the subject pretty strongly. And uh, Jeremy is asking, uh, please discuss monorepos. Do you recommend them for a certain type of project over others? And how do the maintenance costs compare to other approaches and what other challenges do you have when you transition to monorepos? I guess that's a question that Hiram is good, well qualified <laughs> to get started on. Uh, so I uh, heavily endorse uh, monorepos. Um, I, I don't want, I mean, so there's a chapter in, in the book that discusses our monorepo strategy and why we do it and everything like that. Um, if you have access to the Riley online library, you can, you can uh, find it. Um, you know, free of cost or whatever, but, um, you know, we, we appreciate our mono repository. Um, it comes with challenges. I won't say that it doesn't, right. We have a live ahead strategy in our mono repository. Um, we've realized that branching and version management, uh, across lots of repositories or across even like multiple, you know, different vendor versions, these kinds of things. Um, it's actually a bitter, bigger headache, uh, and a much more difficult management strategy than just having a monorepo and everybody living ahead. Um, we can do uh, a number of things. So one of the things it allows us to do is it allows us to do a bunch of centralized, allows us to centralize a lot of the costs that individual teams would be paying themselves, right? So when we update a compiler, for instance, we have uh, built teams and tools and processes in place to like go find all the bugs that the new compiler update causes and then fix them. Whereas if you have a, a more heterogeneous environment where everybody is running their own compiler and they're running their own repository and they're running their own tool chains. Uh, every team needs to make 
that kind of decision and do their own you know, support. And you, know, you have a, a number of different experts across the company that are doing things poorly as opposed to centralizing the management of lots of these, these tasks. You don't have to have a monorepo to do that necessarily, but it makes it much, much easier to do. Uh, another thing that our monorepo gives us is the ability to make, you know, my expertise is in large scale changes and large scale software maintenance. So, you know, if I find, if I need to change a function uh, or, up, or migrate uh, to a new library, I can proactively do that to all the customers that are using the old thing uh, because I have, uh, I can see into all of my users across the company in our mono repository. If you're again in a more heterogeneous environment where you have uh, you know dozens of GitHub repositories somewhere, uh, it's much more difficult to know who your users are, mm -hmm. and it's much more difficult to make that kind of migration proactively on their behalf. Uh, this is something that works at a you know company like Google where we have everything under one roof. Uh, it may not work at other companies where things are much more spread out, but we we heavily uh, rely upon the mono repo. Um, people say like you, you know. That doesn't work. Like, how do you scale that? And that won't scale. Uh, you know, we're a company with billions of lines of code in our monorepo. I think we're we've addressed some of the scaling concerns, and we've shown that it, it can scale at least to where we're at. Come back and ask me another ten years whether we're still in the monorepo or not. But for the time being, you know, we've we've shown that it works. Uh, you you said it might work for 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 Google, but not for other companies. Do you do do you have an intuition for which kind of companies it would work? Uh, I think that there if there's a company that it would work. Uh, so I'll tell you companies that it wouldn't work for. Um, Google has a very horizontal structure in the sense that the culture of the company is such that any engineer can see a lot of what other engineering teams are doing and interact with them. And, you know, I don't have to go through my manager, my manager, my manager to talk to somebody else on another team, right? Like um, it's a very flat, flat structure. If the culture of your company is such that uh, there's a lot more silos, right? So either because of compliance reasons or because of uh, historical, technical reasons, or whatever it is, like that may be a much more difficult sell to make, right? Like if you're a, a conglomerate like GE, right, it may be difficult to convince the folks that are writing the firmware that lives in your fridge to also store their code in the same repository as the people that are writing the firmware that runs uh, an aircraft engine, right? So like that that may be a little bit more um, difficult to implement a modern repository in a company like that. I think it's a social question after all. Uh, it, it's it's technical and social, right? Mm -hmm. Like it it there's certainly cultural aspects that play into this um, as well as technical ones. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We don't have it, at least not in the scale that Google has it. Uh, sorry, can you repeat this? Yeah, uh, we don't we don't have that feature as uh, as Hiram just described it at Google. We might have some smaller, uh, more local examples, but definitely not on the scale that Google is doing. Good. Let me see what other questions there are. So one question, so Anibale Panicella is asking, DevOps is an ongoing practice. So I guess what he means with that, my interpretation is it's not really kind of a wild future that we're imagining. It's kind of, we are doing this. A lot of companies are doing this nowadays. So what are what are the potential limitations? What what kind of research did we do we need to do on top of DevOps? Or have you already won? Is it kind of state of practice? And you know, we we, we are kind I, of I, I can the last thing about it. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, because uh, I think I heard more acronyms mentioned already, like SEC DevOps mm -hmm. or BIS DevOps. I think the key thing here is that is how do you organize? in such an efficient way that the people you need to fulfill your purpose, your value, are all having the same goal. And uh, we first noticed this in the IT, that basically IT people like ops engineers and dev engineers were actually building the same products, creating the same product, but did not have the same goals. Uh, and, and were basically fighting each other. And the question is, where else in the company do you have these kind of, let's say, uh, adversaries where they should actually be working together. And I don't think it's limited to IT. It's limited to your company. If we just have, because if you, if you talk about the domain of IT, then, uh, then of course, uh, make sure that your product is delivered by all the people that you need to deliver that product. 
and they should have the same goal. Uh, EIG, we have, uh, I don't, uh, we have uh, adopted the model from Spotify, where uh, a biz DevOps model, where we have tribes that all have the same purpose, like for example, uh, uh, bring certain mortgage uh, systems or uh, sell the mortgages or uh, payment systems or whatever. Uh, it's focused on the customer and uh, it, uh, it doesn't really matter what kind of uh, type of, of, of employee you are. In the end, the goal is the same. Only your responsibility within that goal can be because you are more specialized IT or marketeer or whatever can be different. And I think uh, if you limit that to IT, uh, then of course there are still a lot of domains that are considered separately, separately like security. And I think def definitely yeah, you should have a look at, okay, how do we make sure that we don't get siloed, but that we do organize our company in such an efficient way that while not, let's say, uh, doing anything bad about, let's say, the, the, the security or whatever, that's what all those people in the beginning said, yeah, but we need to check. Yes, of course you need to check. That still is there. That is not checked. DevOps does not mean that security is not important anymore. Only it is built in and we do the same thing together. And I think that we can still invest uh, in, in what roles and, and what disciplines are still considering themselves special that should actually be just part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a whole list of things I would call at research. Even give us the top three of your list. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to run them down quickly. So. Okay. One is, I mean, like two areas that we're working on. Um, one is just feature flag. So feature flag driven development. What does that do to software development? I mean, you know, it's not something that we teach in our universities. And so feature, you know, it's, you know, adds a tremendous amount of complexity to your code. And when you have something like a mono repo, um, there's feature flags all over the place because, you know, as um, features are being developed and you're continuously um, integrating them, they're not done yet. So you have to put them behind a feature flag until they're done, until they're tested. So what happens to all of those later, you know, and um, particularly when you add experimentation in, then maybe you have two versions and you pick one, what happens to the other? So the whole like feature flag uh, driven development, um, infrastructure as code scripts, um, deployment scripts, so quality and just like the quality of a script could, you know, obliterate a system. You have a configuration or environment setting that's wrong. Um, you know, it doesn't matter about your code quality. Um, flaky tests, um, trying to automate the whole process. But if you have flaky tests, how do you handle that in the deployment pipeline? Um, mobile development versus web development. So web, you can deploy 20 or 200 times a day. Mobile, you can't. So you have to make sure that it's better right the first time because you might not be able to update it for another week or something. Um, do we accumulate more technical debt in this process? Um, just any kind of automation tools and a lot of checks of, in automation, but you can't slow anything down. So there can't be a lot of false positives or how should the false positives. Um, the security of the deployment pipeline. So can you get through the whole deployment pipeline without the ability to um, have someone, you know, cause a problem, security problem in there. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of feature experimentation. So there's a lot of data science around experimentation. So. I, I would just, <laughs> yeah, I, I would just add that I think we're not done yet, if that's the original premise of the question. Um, and part of that is because I think this is one of the areas that practice uh, can tend to lag theory in some ways, because we, uh, there's an investment in applying some of these techniques and sometimes that investment is not the return on that investment is not uh as visible to the people trying to make it initially um and so you know how do we encourage teams to adopt some of these practices and how do we encourage them to to make that investment uh so for instance how do you encourage a team to spend a quarter uh making their tests a lot more robust and not flaky right like we know that you shouldn't have flaky tests, but yet they all we have them all over the place, right? Like how do you how do you uh, incentivize such that such that people are um, willing to to make those types of changes? Uh, and I think there's a lot of tooling um, that still needs to be written to improve the the developer experience and make it essentially make it easier to do the right thing, 
I think that in some sense, since it's like we know what should be done, but without tool good tooling support, uh, engineers won't won't do that because the, of, of habits, of inertia, of uh, the difficulty in, in, in doing the right thing in some senses. Uh, and we, you know, we need to think about what are the tools as an industry that we need to build to, to make some of those, those processes work better. One, one often voiced criticism of DevOps is that people only talk about the tools but never about the processes. But what you, how, how I hear you or what, what, I, what I understand you are saying is we should not forget about the tools anyway, even though. Well, I mean, without like you can talk about the processes all you want, but without good tools that in, encode those processes, uh, people aren't going to follow them, right? Either because everyone is different and we're all going to do the interpret the process differently or because uh, the process is too much overhead. Uh, like just you need good tools. And you know, to Taco's point earlier about, you know, the controls were you, from a broken system, right? You've encoded a broken system in your, in your controls and now you have a, a, a bad uh, ecosystem. Like you have to be very careful about tooling that you don't treat the tools as dogma, right? That you just recognize the tools are an incarnation of best practices and that those may change. Mm -hmm. um, but without good support to automate and tool away a lot of these, these processes or, or in, that you're not going to get compliance. And that's going to be a frustration for everyone involved. Hmm. This, of course, uh, because yes, the process is very important, but uh, I think uh, flexibility is also a very important thing. Uh, uh, tools are currently something that are replaced within, let's say, one or two years. Uh, software, especially front ends, have a lifetime of one or two years max, I think. Hmm. Uh, in the old days, we built our software for decades eh, on the mainframe. Some people still have it running. They say proudly, yes, I was 25 and I built this and now I'm retired. It still runs. We don't build software like that anymore, I think. It's, it's, the, 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 the pace is, is, is much higher and the refreshment is also much higher. It also brings new principles in there. Uh, and the same goes for the way that you, you do stuff. It is much more uh, volatile. And, and should therefore be much more flexible. Mm -hmm. So for the record, we actually do, when we teach engineers at Google, we tell them we're writing code for decades. Uh, Good. Because Good. We, we don't, I, I, don't, I can't guarantee that every product is gonna be around for decades, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But I can't, I can't guarantee that the specific line of code you're writing today won't be around for decades. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to teach them that's what we're, that we're shooting for. That's good. So we are seven minutes away from the closing of the session. So now is a good time to kind of bring it back all the way to the first question that I got from the audience. And Maritia Anisha is asking, and it kind of goes back to the artifacts and, 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 and logging data. And he's saying, regarding logging and monitoring, there's a huge lack of standards on how different companies handle their logging pipelines. That just makes it hard to come up with log analysis tools and approaches that work out of the box for most companies. How do we solve this? Mm -hmm. do, do, we, do we see a need for standardization in this area or is it okay if everybody builds their own tools? I mean, it certainly is not great for us researchers, I can tell you that much, but uh, is, do you think this is a problem for companies as well? Do, do you see this changing? It is a problem, that is for sure. Uh, because indeed, like I said, uh, the, the, the new tools follow each other like, uh, uh, like mad. Uh, uh, better tools come out every time. Uh, one of the things I strongly believe in uh, is that uh, when you deploy with a pipeline, the monitoring should also be uh, incorporated and should, should come as, uh, as code. So it should, be, uh, it should be possible for an engineer uh, to easily code uh, or configure the monitoring system and they should have access to log data, especially without having to log into a production machine to find the specific logs. Uh, that, that for sure is important. Uh, and I do think uh, that at some point, uh, but what is really important, uh, what we always say is that uh, we make a distinction between a tooling culture and an engineering culture. In a tooling culture, uh, uh, it's about the coolest tool, but we try to make it an engineering culture. It's about the, the value that you try to deliver. And at some point, also good can be good enough for now. And we stick to that. We say, okay, this is what we want. This is what it's bringing us. This is what we want to follow up on because it will bring us the data that we need. And we do not try to be the coolest, but we try to be the most effective in that. Mm -hmm. so. 
what, I think what, to the point of like logs and and you know specifically and other kinds of kinds of things that you know many of um, these techniques and 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 the the tooling and the implementation around them have grown up uh, within companies, either within large companies or they've grown up in the open source world and smaller companies adopt them, right? Because they don't have the resources to build their own. I think some of the questions we have to think about are how do we uh, unify, you know, ING's logging tooling and Google's logging tooling and Facebook's logging tooling, right? How, is there a way that we can um, think about ways to uh, expose that as a standard platform, right? So that people can do research on that, right? Like obviously the content of lots of our logs is sensitive and, and you know, mm -hmm. we're not just gonna open that data set up necessarily. Um, but you know, if, if I would love to have somebody that could come in as a visiting researcher, um, do a bunch of analysis, write an interesting paper, and then go to Facebook and do a bunch of, you know, take their tool set with them and do the same kind of analysis without having to rewrite all the tool set because they use a completely different logging infrastructure, right? Um, you know, and so, and that, that's just for logs, right? Like we have a very balkanized, uh, for, like the implementation of a lot of these principles is very balkanized across the industry. And, and lots of that's historical accident. Lots of it is uh, not invented here syndrome. Lots of it is uh, just, you know, the way that, that, that things have evolved, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and thinking about how do we uh, make, build an environment and ecosystem in which that's not the case, I think would be an interesting set of research problems and would, would go forward, you know, coming back again to the topic of MSR, right? Like would go a long ways towards facilitating the ability of this audience mm -hmm. to do the kinds of research that that is not currently being done. Yeah. And, you know, I'll, I'll add to that, I'll, you know, bring the security thing into, into all of it. Um, and if there was a standard, um, I would like to integrate into the standard, the ability to do forensics on the log file. Um, so we've had, I had one student who, who looked at, we, we coined a term forensic ability, the ability to do forensics on the log file. Um, and a lot of times log files are about um, debugging, availability, reliability, things like that, and not about who did that. And um, so if there was a standard to, to keep into that standard, the ability to do forensics on the log file, so you can, you can figure out you know, who caused the breach. Good. So two minutes left. What I suggest we do is we go around and everybody gets 30 seconds for a closing statement before we go into our virtual break. Laurie, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, you know, I guess my, my closing statement is, you know, I gave a list of, you know, of, I don't know, eight or 10 different possible research topics. Um, I don't think there's that many people doing research in this area. So I would encourage you, you know, if you took the time to listen to this um, and you're an academic, that there's a lot of fruitful research topics in this area. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I think eh, that this is a topic that is uh, still really ongoing. Eh? And for us as a financial institution, we have uh, tried to adopt as a more traditional uh, company, uh, yeah, we were one of the early adopters, and it's never it's never ending. Eh? It's continuously improving. It is about continuous learning and continuous improving. Uh, so that's what also makes these kind of sessions very interesting. You always learn the best from hearing about others. Uh, the best uh, stories are of course the failed stories because you learn the most. Uh, uh, but I, I really appreciate always when people tell their stories, tell their experiences. Eh? It always brings something and it will always add a little layer to the next uh, level that you try to achieve in your learning experience. Thank you. Aaron. And, and I would just say that uh, thank you for, for hosting this and, and, and having us be part of this panel. Um, from my perspective, again, it comes back to how do we make engineers more productive? How do we uh, help them do their jobs the best? And if that's DevOps, great. If it's something that we haven't yet discovered yet, that's fine too. Um, but how do we help them be more productive? And if you have ideas on that, uh, how we can be more productive at Google, please let me know. I'm, I'm happy to, to help you to, to experiment within our company about that. I'm gonna get 15 emails now. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than zero. <laughs> so thank you everybody. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks to the audience. Virtual clap for my side. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And we will leave this and go to the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye -bye. Organizing. Bye. Have a good day. Thanks.